So greetings from New York and welcome to the Sustainable Development Goals Investment Fair convened by the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And I want to welcome all of you on behalf of the department. Just want to contextualize the fair before we get to the speakers that, and we have very eminent group of speakers this morning. First motivation for organizing, there are too many fears in the world focus on sustainable financing. First motivation is to bring countries to the forefront who are not considered as usual investment destinations. The big emerging economies and countries which are, appear prominently in the portfolios of investors. So there are members of the United Nations who are very keen to advance sustainable development goals and offer reasonable returns after risk adjustment, but they cannot attract investment. So this platform is created for those countries to present their ideas, get feedback, refine those projects, and eventually attract the investments they need. And I'll come to that in a minute about the group of countries who are presenting projects today. Second objective and motivation, of course, is this fair is part of the larger ecosystem. One is the FFD forum, which is happening today, started yesterday, where policymakers, political decision makers, and experts come together to advance global policy agreements. And this fair is closely linked to those discussions also. And that ecosystem generates higher momentum for decisions towards investing in the sustainable development goals. And that ecosystem also contains the UN entities, quite a big group who are working to advance investment all over the world. And we have brought them together, the UN system, private entities, and other actors who are working on the same objectives. I just want to demonstrate by drawing your attention to the side events this fair will be organizing. We are bringing together private sector speakers and UN system colleagues to talk about public development banks in the SDG investment ecosystem. It's also motivated by the report that the GISD Alliance has produced with clear recommendations for the MDBs and DFIs to advance private investment, attract private investment, crowd in private investment, the sustainable development goals. Another side event we are organizing is by the SDG Fund. SDG Fund is going to announce the doubling of its catalytic investment portfolio at that event. And what that means for countries seeking financial support for projects. The second event is a special presentation at the Namibian mission highlighting Namibia's strategy to attract investment and its green hydrogen program. So this is just to demonstrate how we are bringing variety of actors together and creating spaces for have this conversation which can yield eventually investment in these projects. Today, we have five countries. For the first time, so many countries will be making presentations. Colombia, Nigeria, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Equatorial Guinea. And we're also adding a new feature. We call it the Spotlight presentation. Malawi, which is going to make detailed presentation in September this year, is going to give you a preview and introduce Malawi as an investment destination. So that is the program we had designed for this fair. And this fair is held around the year, April, September, and then December, because the demand is too high. With this introduction, let me invite the Deputy Secretary General, who has recorded a message for opening the fair. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the Global Investors for Sustainable Development Alliance, Welcome to the opening of the 2022 SDG Investment Fair. 
As the North Star for the world's transition to a sustainable, inclusive and a resilient future, the Sustainable Development Goals present abundant opportunities for investments across developing countries. In a relatively short period of time, the FAIR has become a year-round programme that connects forward-looking investors with high-impact bankable projects to boost investment into the SDGs. During the next few days, the FAIR will showcase exciting investment opportunities in Colombia, Nigeria, Guatemala, El Salvador, Equatorial Guinea, Indonesia and Malawi. It will also feature discussions on key policy issues to unlock private capital and financing solutions, including in relation to multilateral development banks and SDG-related reporting metrics. As you engage in these presentations, I call on you to keep in mind the sense of urgency needed to avoid the deepening of today's multiple and mutually reinforcing crises and to prevent the SDGs from being further eroded. The world faces enormous challenges in building back better. The global recovery from COVID-19 is now being thwarted by the cascading effects of the war in Ukraine on food, energy and financial systems, on top of a global economy already battered by rising debt burdens, interest rates, heightened fragility and climate change. I'm optimistic about the steps already being taken by private investors in directing capital towards clear opportunities in sustainable food systems, energy access and digital connectivity and inclusion. As we continue to work towards our shared objectives, we need to ensure that the trillions in the global capital markets are mobilised towards effective, credible and accountable action to accelerate the SDGs. Climate is one example. The IPCC estimates that $2.4 trillion needs to be invested in energy systems annually between now and 2035 to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's what the SDG Investment Fair is all about. Inaction is certainly not an option. We must make bold proposals to build an effective SDG investment ecosystem and fill the financing gaps. That remains the only pathway to a better, sustainable future for all. We must come together to strive to keep alive the promise of the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you for being part of this important effort and I wish you all a fruitful event. I think the Secretary General has set the stage very well, but she also clearly indicated the context is very challenging. And yesterday when the FFD Forum opened, many speakers were labeling the current context as the perfect storm. And you look at the choices that are limiting government's ability to create fiscal space. So the private investment becomes even more critical for rescuing the SDGs. And we don't see it only as a gap, it's an opportunity for the private sector to contribute towards people, planet and prosperity. So with this, let me invite our First speaker, after the opening by the Deputy Secretary General, Mr. Quinn Doyens. He is the Director General International Partnerships at the European Union. Mr. Doyens, you have the floor. Please go ahead. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for having me. Really a pleasure to, uh, to be here um, with you. Um, because I think, um, I mean, as, as you've just uh, said, referring to the perfect storm, I think that the, the current global situation is indeed rightly called a, a crisis on top of a crisis. If we see the, the combined impact of, of COVID-19 and the war against Ukraine uh, has really caused major damage to uh, countries' um, liquidity and debt levels, commodity prices, inflation, growth prospects, uh, and so on. And I think, as we all know, the, the heaviest impacts are felt uh, by the by the poorest um, countries and so amidst all of this i think or, or probably because all of this investment remains absolutely a vital ingredient for achieving the the sdgs and so i think that this fair and the efforts uh, of the united nations to promote investments uh, for sdgs are absolutely welcome uh, necessary and the right thing to do, and I'm 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 very glad to be to be part of it. Um, 
in that sense, I mean, in December last year, uh, the European Union adopted uh, the Global Gateway, uh, which is uh, our strategy to boost sustainable physical infrastructure, to promote uh, enabling regulatory environments, and to promote and boost investment in people's skills and connectivity around uh, the globe. And it aims to mobilize around uh, 300 billion euros in investment in areas such as digitalization, climate, energy, transport, health, education, research, therefore investing, mobilizing investment for the sustainable development goals. And we've seen that our partners uh, in the summits that we've recently had are really keen to engage. The European Commission in doing so is really seeking to create a strategy or to use the strategy and the toolbox we have to have stronger engagement with the private sector because we are convinced that we we need to have the private sector on board because public interventions and ODA in themselves will obviously not uh, suffice. And therefore, in our toolbox, we, we incentivize uh, such leveraging of public and private investments by providing guarantees, uh, by helping to reduce the investment risk, by blending public and private finance, by working with partners to improve the environment for businesses, with a specific focus, of course, on MSMEs, to build marketable, marketable skills, with a specific focus on women and youth. And therefore, a major part of the European external financing instruments for 2021-2027, and we work with multi-annual financial frameworks, is allocated to um, the, the main tool we have in our toolbox, which is the European Fund for Sustainable Development, really designed to leverage that kind of private sector investment and to promote the structural changes to the investment climate that we were just talking about. Now, one of the, the second innovative element of Global Gateway is that we do this by coalescing the full firepower of Team Europe, which means the European Union budget and our different policy expertise, but also our EU member states and our European development finance institutions and by coalescing them by making us work collectively as a team we think that we can invest in bigger more impactful strategic transformational programs and therefore become a much stronger and better partner for our partners across the globe and we will do so deploying this our finance strategies in low and in middle income countries. We are, by the way, setting up a specific high-level expert group to advise us on how we can better mobilize our tools in support of sustainable finance in emerging markets and uh, developing economies. And I would like to take this opportunity to invite high-level experts who are interested in joining this group in a personal capacity. I mean, we have a call uh, that is open until uh, the uh, the 27th of April, so still one more day to go. So if, if you're interested in thinking together with us on what needs to be done and how we can use our tools to bring more sustainable finance to partners, you are welcome. So in conclusion, um, COVID-19 crisis provides us with an opportunity to build back better. And even if it has uh, brought us backwards, in terms of SDGs, it should also energize us to put even more momentum behind that agenda. And I think that an event like the one you are having today is extremely useful um, for that. So many thanks uh, again. Um, we welcome the plan for the SDG Investment Fair to evolve into a year round program, because we think that doing it once, dipping in is not enough. We probably need to boost that all along so that it becomes more, more permanent. And we'd be very keen to remain partners for you on that one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. Actually, you have set the stage well for Mr. Magnus Billing to 
present his contribution, but your global gateway, focus on physical infrastructure, MSMEs, bringing the whole team together, and then engaging experts from all sectors, all walks of life is excellent approach in advancing investment in the SDGs. And as you said, no amount of public funding, which is critical and essential, will be able to provide the investments needed for the SDGs. So we really need to be innovative, join forces, and move forward with a clear conviction there is no other way to save our planet and bring prosperity to every corner of the world. Magnus Billing, who is the very prominent member of GISD, Global Investor for Sustainable Development, but also CEO of Electa. And as all of you know, Sweden had a key role in inspiring the convening of the GISD Alliance because they run SISD, very active alliance within Sweden to invest in the SDGs. Magnus, over to you. Thank you very much, Navid. Uh, and thank you for uh, letting me speak here today and good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Um, as Navid said, uh, I uh, am a member of the GIST Alliance and uh, it's an alliance that has been uh, well, around for three years now. And I would like to talk a little bit uh, of, of it as a, as a, a group and, and why, it's, why I think it's an important group and what difference we can make and where we think we can progress going forward. Uh, the group as, it, as in itself is uh, about 30 organizations from the business side, from the financial industry side, and it represents around 16 trillion US dollars, so a significant amount. What is the, the role of this alliance? Well, the way I look upon it, it is to provide a certain amount of leadership in this in, important task. The leadership in enhancing and, and allocating capital, investment and resources towards the achievement of the Agenda 2030 goals. We do this by working towards enhancing the alignment of business operations, our own and others, uh, finance and investment with the agenda. And in a nutshell, I think it's extremely important that we try to lead by a good example. Our focus in the last couple of years has been very much on mobilizing finance and investment to bridge the finance gap that we recently just heard about. And it's not only a gap, as Navid mentioned, it's also an opportunity if we achieve the goals of Agenda 2030. In this work, it's extremely important that we focus on scaling up investments by identifying and also trying to remove directly or indirectly the uh, obstacles for ensuring that the necessary capital is allocated towards initiatives that are supporting the achievement of the goals. And the last point I would like to mention here when it comes to the focus of the Alliance, it's the last, but perhaps the most important one, we are trying to achieve impact. That's critical for us. We want to reduce the risk of greenwashing and we therefore work towards supporting standardization, metric settings and reporting. Now, if you look to the future and the progress that we think is necessary and that we could contribute to, I would like to mention three or four things. One is uh, scalability and standardization, as I touched upon earlier. I think the importance of building a strong pipeline of investment opportunities at a scalable level that can be repeated on certain platform, and Navid mentioned earlier, one of these platforms is extremely important to get the mainstream capital allocated towards these type of investments. The second point that I think is important going forward is what we're doing here at the fair a changing views, a changing experiences, and a change in knowledge, and thereby also creating transparency around risks, but not least important, the opportunities that is vested in this uh, effort that we are all together striving to uh, manage. And the last point going forward, we are today seeing skewed incentives in the investment chain, 
And I think it's extremely important that we do what we can to ensure that we have the right incentives across the investment chain to ensure that we're allocating the capital properly towards Agenda 2030. And I therefore think it's extremely important that we have these kind of events that David is hosting today, where we get an opportunity to discuss and to meet and see the opportunities and also try to find a solution for the challenges that we have ahead of us. Thank you very much, and I, best, I wish you the best of luck with the event. Thank you, Navid. Thank you, Magnus, for very concisely presenting the GIST's work, and I must commend the members of GIST for their commitment and motivation, and they have done very meaningful work in the last three years with the definition, measurement matrix, and the long-termism that you are bringing to thinking on financing the SDGs. So I commend the work of GIST and we're honored to have all of you working with us. Let me now invite Ms. Fahin Aliboy. She is the Managing Director and Head of the JP Morgan Development Finance Institution to share with us her thinking and what innovative measures JP Morgan is taking to advance investment in the SDGs. Ms. Aliboy, over to you. Thank you so much, Navid. It's a real pleasure to be part of the SDG Investment Forum this morning. Most of us here today are well aware of the growing gap to fund the SDGs and the need to seek innovative financing solutions from the private sector. Given this context, I do want to reinforce the narrative, which sometimes gets lost that the private sector is already an integral part in helping reduce poverty, spurring economic development and providing social services to both employees and communities, a role that extends well beyond finance. And as we advance the agenda to have more private sector involvement in funding the SDGs, we really also need to make sure that private companies are practicing good governance in their business operations, being intentional about sustainable development, and where needed, partnering with governments to maximize the co-benefits of that investment. And as stated earlier, we also need to make sure that we have common definitions, standards, and understanding of how we measure impacts in order to contribute to filling the SDG gaps that we see. So this leads me to kind of why JP Morgan came into this marketplace and what opportunities we see for private investors. I'll then speak a little bit to why the SDGs serve as a sound rubric to evaluate transactions and how we can bring in additional institutional capital to fund the SDGs. So from where I sit, the JP Morgan Development Finance Institution, we were established in January 2020 to actually mobilize finance to support the SDGs in emerging markets, which is our scope of business. The genesis of the JP Morgan DFI was threefold. First was to position JP Morgan to do more in the emerging markets and to work closer with our multilateral development bank and DFI partners. The firm has a very large global footprint and we wanted to help our clients tell a more robust impact narrative to investors. A second part of the genesis was this convergence around the SDGs and the fact that our work, our team's work is very much rooted in looking at SDG gaps in countries and how a transactions use of proceeds can help build that gap. And we're seeing the 2030 achievement of the SDGs and the Paris Climate 2030 goals coming together. And the last impetus, the third, is growing investor appetite and interest in all that is ESG and impact. We wanted to make sure that this demand for transactions for impact metrics was to be satisfied and we've really seen this space accelerate. And just to kind of underscore that the heart of our work was a development impact methodology that was based largely on the work of the IFC. We felt we should stand on the shoulders of others and not reinvent the wheel. The core of what our team does is assess a transaction's development impact and look at the SDG gaps in that country and bring forward those impact metrics to the world of capital markets and sell-side transactions, and that the SDG indicators 
um, and, and frameworks and sub indicators have been very important in that process. We've also seen in recent years, as I'm sure many of you have, that the COVID crisis has really in some way accelerated the trend of focusing on impact and that we are looking much more at the S, the social and inclusion factors, as well as E, which has become fairly well established in ESG rubrics. I feel that we are very aligned in trying to help mitigate climate risk and COVID has helped us understand the intricacies and interrelations of supply chains and, um, and, and workforce participation among many other things. And I think that investors' interest is moving beyond the risk mitigation structures, which originally characterized ESG, towards a much more proactive use of proceeds and impact measurement approach. And here I feel the SDGs can be very helpful in both the ex ante and ex post reporting. So finally, I'd like to turn to how we can bring in additional investment capital towards funding the SDGs. In the past year and a half, we have engaged very closely with institutional investors to understand their needs and perspectives and how we can work closely in bringing them transactions where they can participate very more easily. Think first, investors would like additional disclosure on the actual impacts of a transaction, as detailed and as quantitative as issuers and companies can articulate. They, of course, as said by others, would like standard methodology so that they can compare transactions. And there I feel using a framework like ours, which is SDG rooted and where a framework is publicly available becomes helpful to investors. And then where we can be useful in helping our clients articulate the transactions impacts in the likes of an offering bond memoranda, for example. The second thing that they would like investors is the standardization of the offering. Institutional investors are often keen to invest in products that are well understood in the market and for their asset owners. For example, bonds, loans, equity, syndicated facilities. The more bespoke a structure tends to be, the harder it can be to access. It takes more time, structuring, and increase transaction costs and friction. So a key learning is to keep things simple and to leverage existing financial products and structures wherever possible. And the last thing that investors are looking for is reporting and tracking. Companies need to provide regular reporting on their impact metrics, on what they've committed to, and to supply this information in an easy and consistent fashion. This is also incredibly helpful to build out this space as a scalable asset class, which is where we hope to participate. With that, I'd like to close my remarks and wish the participant of today's seminar a very fruitful discussion and much engagement. Thank you, Fahin, for your very detailed comments, and we fully share your views, standardization of reporting, and we also need to make sure asset managers, asset owners, regulators, and development agencies and the UN system are sitting together to develop these matrix and measurement tools. So we take it very seriously, and we are delighted that you have joined us to work on these aspects with us. Let me thank Kun, Magnus, and Fahin for joining us and for their very insightful contributions, which will help us in shaping our future work. Now I will hand over to our moderator, Ms. Paula Pellier. She's head of SMEs and sustainable business at the Inter-American Development Bank. But before I do so, I have to thank my very competent and outstanding team led by Mary Angela, Barry and Krishnan for arranging the fair and we and bringing together so many actors. So thank you to my team and I admire their commitment and dedication to the work. Paula, over to you. Thank you so much, Navi, and good morning, everyone. Uh, GISD Alliance members, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending the Sustainable Development Goals Investment Fair. This is a forum where governments and investors come together to align commercially viable investment opportunities with the SDGs. And today we are pleased to kick off the investment fair with a presentation from Colombia. Uh, my name is Paula Pelaez. As Navid said, I work with IDB Invest. IDB Invest is the private arm of the Inter American Development Group. 
Uh, and within IDB Invest, I work in our advisory services division, leading our uh, practice of sustainable business. We support at market level, transaction level, and client level to make sure that we are enhancing development impact and sustainability. Um, so before I introduce my um, esteemed panelists and presenters, I wanted to give you a bit of a sense of how the session is going to go. We're going to have 45 minutes. The first 30 minutes, we're going to hear from presenters from Colombia on their investment opportunities that they will highlight. And then we will open up for a discussion with our panelists and presenters. Uh, if the audience has questions, please share them in the chat and we'll be looking through that during the session to integrate them in the discussion as well. Um, so I do have the pleasure of introducing today uh, our panelists. We have Liz Brunder, Managing Director of Global, of Global Sustainable Finance at Bank of America, and David Zmigielski, uh, Vice President of ESG Solutions at Wells Fargo. In our presenters from Colombia today, we have Carolina Diaz Giraldo from the National Planning De Department. She is the Director of Environment and Sustainable Development. We have Juan Sebastián Guzmán from the Unidad de Planeación Minero Energética, UFME. He is coordinator of transmission and distribution at the Electrical Energy Division. We have Daniel Arango Uribe from Bank Colombia. He is the director of energy and natural resources in investment banking. And we have Fernando Suárez, the CFO of Ecopetrol, the commercial gas and power segment. So thank you. And with that, I want to pass on to our presenters from Colombia for their presentation. Paula, thank you so much and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I would like to express my profound gratitude to Mr. Navib Hanif, Director of the Finance Sustainable Development Office and Ms. Amina Mohamed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations for this invitation. And to have the opportunity to present the main agenda of Colombia to tackle climate change. Uh, in this presentation uh, that you are going to see, you will be discover a uh, great investment opportunities that can accelerate the transition to a net zero goal of greenhouse gas emission and projects that uh, will be reduce the vulnerability to climate events uh, by building a resilient, a resilient future. So, as you know, Colombia's leadership in defining and promoting the 2030 agenda has led to design an institutional framework for the uh, implementation of the SDGs, and particularly the SDG 13 related to climate action uh, has become a, a challenge for us, uh, So, for which the country has recently increased its ambition. So, as a result, uh, Colombia has committed to reduce 51% uh, of the greenhouse gas it produces and to achieve that the core of sustainable planning uh, must be a, a cross cutting approach. So ensuring the, the flow of public, private and non reimbursable resources. So therefore, Colombia's National Planning Department seeks to promote the coordination of different efforts of the climate finance system to enhance more stakeholders, uh, increasing the flow of private capital for the new opportunities that the country uh, can offer. Uh, give me next slide, please. Uh, and there, uh, uh, no, this is okay. And there, under our institutional framework, uh, Colombia has been implementing the national climate finance strategy and at mobilizing the necessary resources to support the transition of sectors to low emission and climate resilience development. And recently, we officially launched a green taxonomy, as you know, a classification system that defines uh, the characteristics of an asset or economic activity to be eligible as green. And actually, we are the first country in Latin America and the fourth in the world to publish uh, a green taxonomy, so we are very proud of, of, of this achievement right now. Yes, give me the next, next slide, please. Uh, we have been developing uh, the climate finance broker facility, and there is an intermediary type system for mobilizing climate finance, and this system seeks uh, matchmaking between demand and supply with three main purposes. So, 
first uh, generate a flow of information and a portfolio of projects but uh, mapping sectoral needs. Second, define sectoral cluster to improve uh, interinstitutional coordination, defining priorities to uh, obtain international support and allocation of private financing. And the last one, uh, mobilizing the climate change agenda to streamline the management of climate finance and make it more uh, accessible to those who have a role in the implementation of uh, Colombia's climate commi commitments. So for us, uh, building a solid plan to develop this climate finance broker facility is a good start. Uh, however, it requires time and persistence to, to develop that. And now all the fundamental elements are there. So uh, we have sector commitments. We know the change that we want to make. We know the funding sources. Uh, and we have a plan that is achievable, but in the end, uh, we want to create a marketplace for climate action made up of people who really want to deliver this change. So uh, we welcome you all to participate in our model, uh, not only to look for, uh, your, uh, for profitable projects, but also to support emerging and, and growing markets from an early stage starting from the structure uh, that will lead uh, to a sustainable model. So we have that the project that are presented today can be attractive for uh, to your investment interest. And we also hope that we can continue working together. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, Carolina. I think now we're here from UPME. Uh, okay, good morning for everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here in this great event. So for this presentation, uh, my colleague Hector Rosero and I are going to talk about the energy transition in Colombia, especially for renewable energy and the opportunity to invest in transmission lines. So please, next slide. Uh, in this slide, we can appreciate the strategic objectives from the UTME, Unidad de Planeación Mineral Energética, that is about generate public and economic and social value for the mineral and energy resources in the country, and to incorporate all the requirements in these topics in the planning process for the Colombia country. So please, sector, continue with the next slides. Okay, as you can see on this slide, the energy, uh, energy matrix of our country is basically composed by a hydropower plant. It's about 70% share of the energy production and currently. Um, around the other 30% is produced by fossil fuels. And what we want from the from the Colombian government is to narrow this uh, share of fossil fuels and to promote implementation of uh, renewable energy resources. So by 2034, mm -hmm. We plan to to have a, around 25% um, of the energy produced by renewable energy resources. Next slide, please. Okay. So, at uh, uh, the north of the country, actually, we have a great potential of wind and solar um, primary resources. Uh, we want to take advantage of these uh, of these uh, uh, resources actually to produce energy and to take it to the center of the country where is the where is the where the main uh, load and the, the the most important consumers are placed. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and to do that. Actually, what we want is to build an HVDC transmission power line 
from the north the center of the country. And actually, we are analyzing two different alternatives to do so. The first one is uh, to connect a substation located at the Nora de Guajira region to substation Cerro Matoso, uh, assessing two different possibilities. One with a mixed path, submarine cable and overlying um, transmission line. And the other option is to connect the uh, Guajira with the substation Primavera with the um, uh, overland uh, uh, power line. Uh, this line would have uh, a length approximately of 800 kilometers, so where we are considering right now. And mm -hmm. um, it will allow to to, to transfer the energy producing La Guajira to the center of the country. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, this is basically this is basically what I already explained. We have two different alternatives. One is to connect uh, Guajira with Cerro Matoso, and one to connect the Guajira with the Primavera, that is another substation in the center of the of the country. Um, to the right, you can see the timeline from cradle to grave. We started this project last year, but actually uh, we assessed a solution to evacuate the energy, the potential energy uh, in the Guajira region in, in 2017. And we, are, we have been conducting different studies to, to take this project to reality. So we, we are planning to build this uh, transmission HVDC line. And uh, basically the, the, the most effective uh, uh, co-solution would be the one that would be awarded with, the, with, this, with this project. Um, and yeah, we, we expect to, to, to have this project fully complete by 2028. So we will be able to transfer around uh, 3,000 megawatts uh, from from La Guajira to, to the center of, of the country. Um, next slide, please. Okay, in this slide, you can see a timeline. Basically, we started the project last year. We defined some uh, sense of reference for the project. And we started with some preliminary studies. And um, from the year 2023 to, from, to the year 2026, we consider we will be doing the process related with licenses and permits. And uh, we, we expect to have this project ready to build by the year 2028. That will, that will be the, the construction process and, and the commissioning of the, of the line itself. Okay. Next, please. Okay, well, thank you very much for your for attending our presentation. Thank you, Hector and Juan. And over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Uh, here, what we as a bank want to show when uh, investors is that. Uh, these types of projects have access to a broad number of financing options and that the banks and the investors are open and have appetite for this type of, uh, of, this, of, of projects. This is due to the fact that the Colombian regulatory framework for transmission has and um, is the base for predictable and, uh, and certain cash flows. So here in this slide, what we show to you is that there's a broad number of, of options uh, available, capital markets, uh, the banking market, which we um, open it to, 
uh, that would incorporate financing. This is important uh, because uh, one of the questions we receive from investors coming into Colombia is if uh, there's the possibility of getting project financing uh, that is uh, non-recourse financing from uh, local or international international banks in Colombia. And uh, the answer that we want to uh, give the investors is yes, there are project financing capabilities in Colombia. Uh, we also like want to show here that we have uh, the possibility for this type of projects connecting uh, a green uh, electricity generation to the to the matrix. Uh, there's the possibility of issuing green bonds in the capital markets, and there's also the possibility of getting um, green financing from from local banks or international or or other types of banks. Or, there's many uh, options, and uh, here the short uh, message is that uh, there's bank appetite and investor appetite uh, to to provide financing for for these projects. Thank you, Daniel. Fernando, uh, I think you'll now walk us through the second opportunity. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, my name is Fernando Suarez. As you mentioned before, I'm the, the CFO uh, for the commercial gas and power businesses in, in Ecopetrol. And I'm here well representing the company that is one of the most important energy groups in, in Latin America. Uh, important to say that re the Republic of Colombia is our main shareholder. Uh, having 80, almost 89 percent of our shares. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, just just to say that uh, a couple of months ago we released our 2040 strategy, uh, and uh, it's important to mention that is this strategy is supported on four pillars. One is competitive returns. Cut, second, cutting edge technology. A uh, third one, growing with the energy transition. And the fourth one is generate value through TESG, with, uh, which basically means technology, environment, social, and governance. Uh, important to mention that technology for us is in the heart of our value generation. Uh, well, just let me emphasize here some key points of our strategy. Well, the first one is that by 2040, we have the objective to have around 30 to 50% of our EBITDA coming from low emission businesses, uh, which means a huge transformation uh, from where we are today. Second one, the innovation and technology will support hardly our decarbonization and energy efficiency goals. And the third key point, uh, I would say that is retooling and reskilling of our people will be basically key factor of our success in, in, in delivering this strategy. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, well, as you may know, in 2021, Ecopetrol set the objective to be carbon neutral for scopes one and two and uh, to reduce well, a 50% cutback of total emissions by 2050. And basically to reach this goal, uh, in order to reach this goal, well, the company identified uh, an abatement curve. Uh, in this analysis, we basically identified initiatives such as zero flaring, energy efficiency, uh, fugitive emission reductions, uh, among others, uh, uh, that are basically competitive at a shadow price defined by the company around $40 uh, per ton or CO2 equivalent. Other initiatives, uh, such as hydrogen, CCUS, uh, battery storage, are still challenging in terms of costs. That's why we need to find ways to reduce them, uh, those costs, in order to make them as competitive as, as possible. 
Uh, next slide, please. Well, what we are presenting here, the investment opportunities, uh, we are presenting two big areas that we are currently developing in the company. Uh, one is low carbon hydrogen, and the other one is solar farms. Uh, let me go to the first one in, in hydrogen. Uh, we are developing right, developing right now two projects in our refineries, uh, green hydrogen projects in both of them uh, that right now are in pre-feasibility phase. Uh, uh, important to mention that the idea is that Ecopetrol would participate as off-taker of the hydrogen produced here. And it's also important to mention that we are under a process of finding the, uh, the option to have also a strategic partners to develop these, these, these projects. Uh, very important for us, you know, we are looking for cooperation funds, of course, grants, guarantees, uh, concessional resources in order to take the projects further in the developing uh, process. Uh, you know, as Mr. Doens, from the European Union mentioned uh, in, the, in the introduction of this uh, space, uh, this you know, financing scheme and, and the competitiveness we get in this, in this phase is, is very important. Um, in solar farms, in solar, where you know, the technology uh, phase is a lot more mature and we, uh, in Ecopetrol, basically we already have cell generation plants uh, we are looking for competitive financing and partners in order to increase uh, renewable participation in our energy matrix as, as a company. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Just uh, a bit more detail in hydrogen. Uh, but here, let me just uh, emphasize some, some key points. First one, our hydrogen plan is aligned to the roadmap the Colombian government released uh, last last year, you know, and uh, of course, green hydrogen for us is a is a key factor and an objective, uh, a, a very important objective for the company. Uh, and also, let me emphasize that we are developing hydrogen projects in four different fronts. Uh, one is, you know, the decarbonization of our own operations, but also we want to develop mobility. Uh, also blending with natural gas, um, exporting, uh, you know, exporting hydrogen, just basically taking advantage of the privileged natural resources we have in Colombia. Um, next slide, please. Just here, uh, the generalities and context of the projects, just basically, you know, there are many objectives, but our, our main objectives in these projects you know, very important to say. Uh, we want to develop knowledge. Uh, we know that in many places in the world, in the European Union, in the United States, in Japan, they have, a, 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 you know, a, a way further in, in the knowledge of these projects. We want to do it in, the, in Colombia. Uh, we want to define technical, operational, and financial allies. Those will be very important for us in order to develop these projects. And of course, the main goal to, to reduce the CO2 emissions that we have in our operations and also in, in the country. Uh, next, please. Thank you. Just some high level figures of hydrogen projects uh, we, we so far have. Um, well, first of all, positive in our calculation, we have positive internal rate of returns a positive net present value in our projects, also a positive annual EBITDA. And these three points are very important from the point of view of investors. You know, these ratios are, are, are key factors here. And, you know, with this, at the end of the day, we, we want to have an LCOH that will be, you know, more competitive and, of, of course, uh, will contribute to the main objective to reduce the CO2 emissions. Uh, next slide, please. Just going to the solar part. Well, the first is, uh, this is one project we have. It's is, is a solar farm project that we want to develop at the Cartagena refinery. Uh, it's the construction of a solar farm with up to 23 megawatts of installed capacity. 
Uh, in the near future, we want to connect it with the, to the green hydrogen project, you know, that will be developed at the same place. And we want this plant operationally uh, by mid-2023. Uh, in the next slide, we will see another project that is the solar farm called La Sierra, that is right in the middle of the country will be a plant for with 56 megawatts uh, of solar uh, uh, energy uh, installed. Here we are uh, calculating to uh, contributing with more than 11.3 kilotons of CO2 reduction uh, uh, per year. And we want to have it by October 23 in operation. And the final slide, we uh, are presenting uh, the thank you the, the 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 other other project the solar farm in Rubiales uh, will be basically the largest solar farm for self generation in Colombia with 87 megawatts of energy installed uh, ecopetrol in the three of them the uh, Cartagena uh, La Sira and here in Rubiales will be off taker of this um, energy well, just let me finish uh, this uh, uh, short presentation saying that in Ecopetrol we are aligned, of course, with the importance and urgency of energy transition. And of course, we want to contribute to these objectives and all other SDG goals that uh, uh, has been established by, the, by the, uh, the global community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernando, for your presentation. <clears throat> I would now want to open it up for a discussion with our panel. So Elise and um, David, I wanted to, maybe we can start with you, Liz, uh, and, and just get initial reactions. What stood out to you from these presentations? We've heard opportunities from UPME on green energy transmission lines with projects of connectivity and expansion of grid. We've heard from Ecopetrol their uh, opportunities of low carbon hydrogen, green hydrogen, solar farms. Uh, we've also heard from Bank Colombia <clears throat> the different financial structures and mechanisms that are available in the country uh, to spur investor interest. Um, and, and of course, Carolina showed us an interesting framework of how they are creating a marketplace to attract uh, and, and do this matchmaking uh, for the different projects. So, with that, uh, I want to open it up um, to, to Lisa and David. Um, Lisa, if you want to go first, and then I'll pass it over to David. Yes, thank you, Paola. And first, I'm sorry I, I can't join you by video with some technical issues here, but I'm very pleased to have been uh, invited to participate in this important discussion. Uh, First of all, I just want to commend the government of Colombia and, of course, Echo Patrol uh, in the comprehensive approach that the government takes to these types of, of topics uh, to be able to put in place the green taxonomy. We know that FDN plays an important role in the country as well. These kinds of structural elements are really critical for uh, investors to be able to come in and finance these kinds of projects at scale. And so the, uh, the approach that's been taken in, in terms of uh, building a pipeline of projects, um, looking at, uh, on, in the first presentation, transmission in addition to generation uh, is very important and you know, lays out a very good uh, model for financing, uh, which, which follows on you know, the government of Colombia's very thoughtful and comprehensive approach in the 4G road program, for example. So uh, you know, it, it's, it's very good to see the government using the same comprehensive approach uh, for the energy transition. I think the other thing that stood out to me, uh, particularly in the uh, Echo Patrol presentation, was uh, the the focus on both new technologies like hydrogen as well as proven technologies like solar. Uh, at B of A, we have a global sustainable finance team that, uh, in addition to having made important commitments of our own for our own uh, net zero commitments by 2030 as well as, or sorry, by, by uh, 2050 in scope three, which includes transition for our clients, um, and a $1.5 trillion commitment to help finance that transition for our clients by 2030. 
Uh, we have uh, an innovation group which specifically looks at new technologies. So we have a very active uh, interest in supporting clients who are investing in, in new technologies like green hydrogen because they really are the future for uh, our ability to decarbonize uh, the planet. And so, you know, very much um, uh, interested in, in those plans and, and working with development partners to try to uh, bring those to fruition uh, while they're still on the path of, uh, you know, commercial uh, commercial viability. Uh, so in addition, I think that we um, are trying to work together with our clients and development partners, much in the same way as articulated in the opening. Uh, B of A has also developed a, a development finance framework and you know, closely works with MDB and DFI partners as well as concessional funds to look at how we can you know, best support these types of, of projects as they come on stream and in the level of, of uh, market readiness that they are. So I, I would be very interested to hear more about uh, some of the approaches, particularly with, which may be the more difficult part, with relation to the, the, the new technologies like green hydrogen that you're, uh, that you're seeing in the market. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Lise. David. <clears throat> yes, thanks very much. Um, and I would really echo many of Liz's remarks. Um, you know, thank you for uh, a robust presentation and, and very much actionable uh, opportunities presented uh, today on the part of the presenters um, that uh, ultimately result in um, what, what we would regard as, as, as high impact salient opportunities for investors. I think the, the framework that, um, uh, that, uh, that the government has put in place through the green taxonomy um, is not only a, a first for Latin America, but has uh, put forth a uh, really a, a high benchmark uh, for um, a high benchmark impact um, solution that is going to be well regarded in the region and, and hopefully replicated. So that would be kind of, you know, maybe one question that I have uh, to the government uh, around its strategy around climate finance uh, and climate resiliency. Um, uh, how, what were the, what was the thinking there around, you know, its, its relevance for business um, in developing this this framework, how are you regarding this as, as good for business on a go forward basis? Excellent, David. Uh, maybe Carolina, can I pass that over to you? You're there. Or if any of the other representatives from Colombia wants to yes, can you hear us? Yes, yes, can you hear us? Yes. Now yes. we can. Yes, my name is Alejandro Noguera. I'm the climate finance facilitator from the Andes Partnership embedded to the National Planning Department. So regarding you, your question, the National Climate Finance Strategy it is the way to mobilize our uh, financial resources. We have applied this, uh, this strategy to the plan of the government, the sectoral and from the territory. So we are trying to mobilize different projects, not just uh, with a big ticket, uh, just to mitigate the, 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 the emissions that we have uh, sent as a goal from the government, but also for the adaptation of the territories. As you know, Colombia uh, has um, a lot of our commitments were to establish different goals in, in, in order to uh, provide a better and resilient future for the society. So we hope that this strategy can be applied uh, from the territories and our sectors. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And next, I and next, I have for, have for. Sorry, maybe you guys. Sorry, can maybe you guys. Because I can hear a big echo. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the other question I had for, um, I think both presenters and panelists, and it's around social value. And I know some of you, Fernando, you mentioned some of it as part of the strategy of Ecopetrol on making sure that you're reskilling labor and so on. But it would be interesting to hear both from our panelists and from the presenters of the project, how are you incorporating a view of the social value of these specific projects that we're presenting to the table, right? The SDGs are indivisible, they're interlinked. Uh, of course, we are advancing SDG 13 as a critical uh, part of, of, of an ambitious climate agenda of the country. But how are you integrating as you evaluate these opportunities, uh, the social value? 
David, I'll start with you if that's okay. Sure, I would be happy to, and, and we could, you know, for example, take uh, the example of the, of the transmission project uh, and some of the key areas that we would be looking at, you know, certainly are, uh, is the impact on communities, uh, the, the energy will be ultimately trans transported to the center of the country and critical uh, indicators for us as well as for the investors that we would work with um, would be the ultimate uh, impact for communities there, the, the, the tangible um, uh, the change in development and uh, as well as you know the impact on rural, rural communities in, in particular. Another area of focus would be uh, actually on the sustainable use of, of the underlying land and the, the right of way uh, utilized for uh, the transmission projects. Um, you know, certainly land uh, is one of the, the focus areas of the, the Columbia uh, green taxonomy. And so certainly there are some uh, interdependencies there uh, between the, the energy projects and transmission projects, as well as uh, the utilization of this energy to decarbonize uh, land use and, and agriculture in Colombia, which, as I understand, uh, under the taxonomy is, accounts for really 59% of domestic emissions. Uh, so certainly uh, those the, the nexus there between uh, uh, renewable energy and, and transmission, as well as decarbonization of land use uh, and, and uh, utilization in rural communities would be a particular focus uh, for this dialogue and, and the narrative that is marketed to investors. Absolutely. Liz, would you have any comments? Yes, I would say in addition to the, the uh, importance of the effect on the community that, that David just mentioned, uh, the diversity of the workforce, the diversity of the governance of the uh, projects and the organizations are also important. And I think there are some, uh, you know, KPIs that can be set in that regard that ensure equal equal participation and 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 uh, equality of voice in those discussions. Uh, and I think that there are, you know, many different ways of, of looking at how to incorporate those kinds of metrics, either through sustainability-linked structures in financing or uh, just to have them as part of a social uh, bond or social uh, loan that would be targeting, you know, some of the use of proceeds around um, building into some of those uh, areas. And I, I do want to call out specifically the reskilling that was mentioned because that is very important in terms of, you know, being able to take care of the current workforce as the company and, and the country goes through a really major transition of energy uh, supply. Absolutely. And it's interesting you mentioned the sustainability linked uh, instruments that, again, tend to focus maybe more on green quantitative aspects and, and, and some of the social. We're starting to see some of, of a glimpse of that and hopefully we'll see more of it. Um, I, uh, I do realize that we have our uh, presenters from Nigeria. Um, very excited to Hola. continue on with their presentation. Fernando, ah. go ahead. Yeah. No, just I, I wanted to answer your your question because this this is something very important for us in Ecopetrol. Your question is is critical, and I I don't want to lose the opportunity. You know, in in our in our 2040 strategy, uh, we have the TESG as a key factor, no? As I already mentioned, but just let me give you some 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 numbers that we have in the strategy. The first one is that we want more diverse human talents in our in our um, in our operations. We want to have, for example, by 2040, uh, we want 20 uh, 230,000 non-oil related jobs uh, in in our operation. For example, that's a huge number now, no? Uh, and also some some key factors that we or key key figures that we already have. For example, in the in the solar projects that we already developed in the country, uh, we have uh, some solar farms already operating. Uh, the workforce is uh, has been almost forty percent, uh, uh, you know, women, forty percent, and for almost 70% uh, of them uh, have been the first job opportunity, you know? So that's, that, that has been something very important for us uh, in the solar, you know? And they are key, uh, you know, they are facts. 
in hydrogen in our plan we want to produce more or less or to 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 open opportunities for more than 20 uh, sorry 10,000 people uh, you know working in those projects because they are huge projects you know you have the the whole chain from the generating of the energy the production the distribution you know everything the whole chain can create easily more than 10,000 jobs new jobs uh, in in the country so uh, you know just I, I think that's very, very important for, for us, this, this part of the social impact that we have uh, uh, for, with these projects. Absolutely, and thank you. Thank you for calling that out. I think it's very important. So, as, as I was saying, I do think this is just a glimpse of what we could have in terms of this conversation and exploring further these opportunities. As both Liz and David said, these are interesting uh, aligned opportunities uh, on, on innovation, and uh, a very ambitious planned agenda. Keep questions coming to the UNDESA team and they'll connect you with more information on the presentation as well. I want to thank you, Liz and David, uh, and all of our speakers from Colombia. This has been a great um, start of a discussion on these opportunities. And uh, I now would like to pass on to our uh, colleagues from Nigeria as their presentation will start shortly. Thank you very much. Nirida here, the moderator for the Nigeria session. I just want to confirm that you can hear me. We can hear you. Great. So thank you everyone for being here today. Um, GISD Alliance members, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending the Sustainable Development Goals Investment Fair. So um, this is a forum where governments and private investors come together to align commercially viable investment opportunities with the Sustainable Development Goals. Today, we're pleased to kick off the investment fair with the presentation of um, really great projects that are ready for investment by representatives of the government of Nigeria. Um, so, as I mentioned, I will be the moderator for this discussion. My name is Nirida Podewal, and I'm Senior Vice President for ESG Investing with Fixed Income at BlackRock. Um, and let me now introduce you to our panelists. Um, we have Lena Osman, Head of Sustainable Finance at Standard Charter, Titus Nampala, Head of Financial Institutions and Sovereigns at Rand Merchant Bank, um, Felix Fernandez Shaw, uh, Director for Sustainable Development Policy and Coordination DG for International Partnerships at the European Commission. And allow me to also introduce you to the presenters. Um, Her Eminence Adijoke Orelope Adifulue, Senior Special Advisor to the President of Nigeria on SDGs, Mr. Adeshina Emmanuel, Director of Investment at the Nigeria Investment Promotion, and um, Mr. Ahmad Salihijo the CEO for the Rural Electrification Agency. Um, I invite Team Nigeria to now make the presentation. With the commitment to turn on well-established protocol, I'm uh, delighted to speak to you at this year Global Annual Investment Fair on financing the SDG. I really am honored to be here must also commend the leadership of UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UN DESA, organizing this in very July with the Global Agenda for Sustainable Development. I'd like to especially thank the UN ECOSOC team for their role in advancing the implementation of the SDG by operationalizing the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, enhancing the SDGs. Uh, this year, FIA will certainly amplify the key roles of the non state actors to explore different financing strategies towards the realization of the 2030 agenda and for the SDGs, especially taking place in this very critical circumstance in the history of our planet. Very distinguished participants, to recall that it's about seven years now since the president of our country. Join other world leaders during the 70th session of the UN General Assembly in September 2015 to adopt the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. 
2030 agenda for sustainable development and visions in present and the future as economically sustainable, socially inclusive, and environmentally resilient. This vision is expressed through the framing of the 17 SDGs, 169 targets, 230 performance implications. Broadly, the SDG are in further call to action and poverty, no ramification, safeguard the planet and ensure that all people, irrespective of their gender status, enjoy peace and prosperity by the year 2030. However, as the SDG are interrelated and interconnected, we have since recognized that the SDG cannot be achieved standalone policies and programs. All be carefully and scientifically integrated into our national and sub national, medium and long term development policies and plans. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, 2020 has been a year to remember for decades. Hope. COVID 19 pandemic has created an unprecedented global crisis, disrupting our health systems, social economic condition of nearly every individual around the world, including millions of Nigerians. Here in Nigeria, the pandemic has further pushed millions of Nigerians into poverty, estimated 95.7 million end of 2022. This unprecedented scale of containment measure employed across the globe, including lockdowns, restrictions, movements and other non pharmaceutical interventions pushed global economy into the worst recession since the Great Depression. This caused a major setback in the energies. When the pandemic emphasizes challenges and risks, it led to loss of jobs and livelihoods, as well as significant impact on sources of utilization. It also offer opportunities for governments to bring forward better towards achieving the SDGs. Multi-dimensional impact of the pandemic is set an opportunity to prioritize investment on key sustainable development goals for our national development and integrated responses towards achieving the SDGs. Very distinguished participants, SDG 17 talks on partnership of goals and specifically target 17, target 17 5. Talks on investment promotion for least development uh, for least developed countries. Statistics by UNCDA put global investment needs to be between five trillion dollars to seven trillion dollars per year. And historically, the international community signed up to spend 0.7 percent of the world GDP. Approximately $500 billion annually. Or it's still been average that even all the nation money to raise is 0.5%, this will not be sufficient to realize the finance performance. However, estimates for investment need to fund the implementation of the SDG through the developing countries pre COVID 19. Ranges from $3.3 trillion to $4.5 trillion per year, mainly for basic infrastructure, food security, climate change, education, and adaptation, health, and education. Accordingly, the pre COVID 19 year report estimates that Nigeria made approximately $85 billion annually, scientifically and sufficiently funded in the largest economic continent with a GDP of almost 440 billion dollars. Therefore, we must work together as partners to strengthen our collaboration, especially with the private sector, through investment because they play a big role in resource mobilization, accelerate efforts by the government of Nigeria in order to bring forward better towards an inclusive job region. As we recommit ourselves, I want to emphasize Nigeria's strong support for the SDGs. 
and in line with the transformative promise of 2030 agenda for sustainable development. I want to conclude this short remark by reaffirming Nigeria commitment to the successful implementation of the SDGs. Look forward to working closely with you all in this decade of action for the global home so that no one is left. Excellencies, Member State, UN Desert Team, please permit me at this juncture to give the floor to our brother and our partner, Managing Director of Rural Education Agency of Nigeria, to present the first project on energizing education for the Managing Director of Rural, Rural Education Agency of Nigeria. Thank you all for your attention. God bless you all. God bless the Republic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the SDGs Office, for uh, inviting us to uh, this very, very important uh, investment fair. Uh, and I would like to seize this opportunity to also uh, stand on existing uh, protocols. Uh, and if I may, uh, if you could just take us to, to my slide. Uh, I don't know if uh, who is controlling the slides. Slide, sl slide 12, please. Thank you very much. So as the uh, essay to the uh, president on SDG uh, mentioned, uh, the Rural Electrification Agency uh, it's an implementing agency of government um, carrying out projects uh, within rural uh, areas where uh, we have unserved and underserved Nigerians. Uh, with, th with this special intervention project, uh, the Energizing Education, uh, this started off uh, a few years ago uh, when the federal government approved at the Federal Executive Council the provision of uh, clean and reliable power uh, to 37 uh, federal universities uh, and seven affiliated uh, teaching hospitals. Uh, so currently it's been uh, implemented in three phases, uh, currently covering about 23 universities and four teach teaching hospitals. Uh, these three phases are funded by the federal government of Nigeria, uh, the World Bank, uh, and the Africa Development Bank uh, in total in the tune of uh, $315 million. Uh, I would like to also note you to note that uh, the first one uh, currently being funded by the federal government of Nigeria uh, was actually one of the beneficiaries uh, of the first Nigerian sovereign green bond uh, where these projects actually uh, benefited uh, from uh, from the green bonds uh, project. So in the phase one, uh, seven of the projects uh, have now been completed uh, and they are currently delivering over 13 megawatt peak of solar PV uh, and has been delivered and they are currently in use. Uh, for the second phase uh, of the World Bank, uh, it's currently under procurement uh, and is scheduled to, uh, to, to be concluded in the next couple of months. Uh, while implementation will take uh, the, uh, the next 18 uh, to 24 months. Uh, whereas uh, for the phase three for the African Development Bank, uh, the eight projects are scheduled to begin in quarter four uh, in 2022, uh, while implementation is expected to start uh, in, in, in quarter three, 2023. Uh, so one of the particular reasons that we believe at REA, uh, it's very important uh, for us uh, to, to put this project forward is uh, first and foremost, I think uh, we can overemphasize the importance of these projects in Nigeria's commitments to the nationally determined contributions. Uh, and as, as reiterated by our president at the last COP, you know, uh, we have pledged to achieve net zero by 2060, uh, which we have several uh, bills and regulations uh, which have are now currently in place to put Nigeria in a very, very uh, commendable position to achieve uh, these are these are very very critical goal so we believe these projects are projects that would help nigeria 
uh, get to uh, its nationally determined contributions. As you have seen, you know, these are all solar PV uh, projects uh, spanning up to 30 mega, uh, megawatts of power. Uh, and also, I think in terms of the SDGs, you know, this project contributes directly uh, to all uh, the SDG goals, but uh, perhaps maybe goal one, two, and 14, but all other ones, uh, especially access to reliable energy. Uh, we, you know, this project uh, is very, very important and uh, also demonstrates uh, that with collaboration with uh, you know, yourselves, uh, we're able to achieve this project. So the this impact of this uh, current projects, you know, to the SDGs, as I mentioned, is very, very critical. Uh, there's also a huge potential for similar projects to uh, come up in, in Nigeria and the rest of Africa, uh, where we can use the same model, you know. So we're happy to report back that because we have also been in a position now to implement uh, the phase one, you know, uh, we are able to bring to the table uh, a lot of expertise in terms of how these projects can be built in a sustainable manner. You know, so uh, this is something that we are currently demonstrating uh, with, with, with the phase one projects and we're implementing uh, with the phase two projects as well. Uh, you know, and I'm happy today as well, uh, we've also invited our colleague, uh, the acting director of uh, renewable energy and rural access from the ministry, uh, who is currently on the call with us, uh, where, you know, we are jointly developing uh, this sustainability plan uh, to ensure uh, that all projects that we're delivering uh, under the Energizing Education Program uh, is carrying all stakeholders, uh, including uh, the Federal Ministry of uh, Power, the Federal Ministry of Education, uh, the uh, Nigerian Universities Commission, the uh, beneficiary universities, uh, and the REA, uh, and of course the private sector developer as well. So with what we have seen so far in terms of the business model, what we believe works best uh, is some kind of a public-private partnership uh, which we are currently demonstrating with the projects uh, where, you know, we have a private sector proponent uh, who can uh, go ahead with the uh, operations and maintenance of this project throughout uh, the life of the project. Then in addition to that, um, you know, we, we expect that there will be a seven to 10 year uh, return on investment. This is uh, based on some preliminary studies that we're currently doing uh, just so that uh, by putting that in place, we know that uh, any sort of investment coming in from an equity uh, perspective uh, should be able to uh, see, see this project through. Uh, and the good thing as well is that we have done quite a lot of pre-feasibility studies as well. Uh, we only need to validate these results uh, so that uh, we are required to have these projects uh, move on to uh, procurement. Uh, with the total estimate budget of 223 a million dollars. Uh, I think this is appro appropriately sized investment for uh, for for potential uh, or strategic investors coming into the phase. And over the uh, execution of the three phases as well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there has been a lot of learning, you know, uh, and then from a, a university by university basis, uh, we will be in a very good position uh, to be able to align, you know, uh, which models uh, we would apply uh, for successful implementation uh, of the project. Uh, so I think all in all, you know, um, you know, this is where, you know, we, we, we are uh, at the moment uh, and uh, the expected impact uh, of this uh, particular uh, investment, you know, is obviously going to be the power received uh, on behalf of the universities. Uh, we obviously have uh, you know, an opportunity to create a lot of jobs you know, uh, an opportunity to also power neighboring communities within the university, uh, you know, including uh, perhaps agricultural hubs, you know, and some uh, few select uh, uh, industries. So uh, in, 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 in all in all, you know, uh, as you can see within the sector, uh, this is an investment uh, that would be able to take Nigeria, you know, and uh, most importantly, bring uh, the, the required electricity to, to, our, to our education sector, uh, where, you know, we can carry out uh, researches, we can carry out uh, various programs around, you know, uh, developing uh, a lot of um, uh, infrastructure for, for the country. So I think uh, this is a very, very uh, important uh, project to the country. Uh, and I'm happy today I've been given the opportunity on behalf of uh, 
uh, uh, the, uh, the Royal Electrification Agency and the Federal Ministry of Power uh, to present this uh, to be able to uh, bring this forward uh, uh, for questions and, and, and any further clarifications. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, Barry, I don't know if you could uh, hear me. I hope I didn't just present to myself. <laughs> oh, we heard you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We just didn't okay. know if you were presenting some of the other projects, but this is this is okay. good. So, I will we'll so give I it back. I'll, I'll hand back to uh, Her Excellency. Maybe uh, she can call on the, the next speaker. Okay. Um, very distinguished participants, permit me to invite uh, Mr. Emmanuel Adeshidon, the Director of Investment and General Investment Commission, to take the floor. I hope Mr. Adeshidon is with us. Yes, it's online. Mr. Adeshidon, you have the floor. What I might suggest, rather than having everybody wait, Nirad, if we can throw it back to you uh, and the panelists, maybe to discuss the uh, renewable energy projects and the uh, interesting overlay made by Her Excellency. And then when uh, our colleagues from Nigeria are, are able to connect, we can go back to them to hear the rest of the projects. Barry, yeah, sure. Um, just again, confirming that you're able to hear me. Yes, we can hear you and see you. Okay, great. Yeah, so thank you so much for uh, the presentation on the renewable energy project so far. Um, and, um, you know, we do look forward to hearing about the others as well. Uh, but just to kick this off, um, Lena, Titus, Felix, I would actually like to give you the opportunity for to express any initial thoughts or comments or maybe questions you had to ask for the presenters um, before opening up the floor to questions from the audience. Um, yes, Felix. Lena, you were first, I think. Yeah, no, that's fine. I, I was actually going to come in and say, uh, first of all, uh, really, really glad to be here. Very happy to hear about the great progress that's going on in Nigeria. I think it's one of our it's a, it's one of our major footprint markets. We are um, uh, we have been seeing quite a lot of initiative uh, from uh, from different clients on um, attending to the to the SDGs and how they're 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 thinking about um, about transforming their businesses. I was very I was very happy to see in the presentation today that we are tackling renewable energy. One of the one of the highlights is uh, of a of a report that we just over a year ago that we released was that um, the there's a 32.3 billion dollar uh, power investment opportunity for the private sector um, in Nigeria. And I think that um, uh, that hits the core of where um, uh, where this project is 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 going. I think one of the one of the things that that jumped at me was uh, the the strength of the fact that there is a track record now. There is a lot of experience that has come into the project, which means that it it it's easier to attract um, uh, investor and 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 bankability as well to, to such projects. One of the things that I would probably highlight is um, just on the amount of, 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 of capital uh, that is being sought from an, from an equity perspective or even a financing perspective was one of the questions that I had to the team um, on what they were thinking about in terms of quantum, but also uh, whether how they're thinking about uh, future financing. So that the mix of debt and equity that they're looking to include in, the, in these projects. Um, specifically, you know, how they think about potentially including sustainable finance uh, type of transactions or structures that get embedded in these projects, which further attract uh, both financing and, um, and equity opportunities. Uh, but that, those are the two main questions that I had. It would be, would be really good to hear from the team on that.
Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Lina. Uh, and and uh, do I answer one question at a time, or do we wait to get all the questions? Um, we can make this more interactive and take the questions as they come, I feel. Okay, okay. Uh, so I think um, uh, with the kind of proposal that uh, we have come through today, you know, uh, with some of the questions uh, Lina is also asking, uh, I think we're still open to uh, having some of those uh, figures uh, come across to yourselves. Uh, but of course, in terms of the uh, uh, equity and future financing, I think it just relies or depends on the peculiarity on, of each of the universities, because as you are aware, you know, we do have to uh, have an understanding uh, on the consumption of the universities, on what sort of excess power they have, what sort of, um, you know, demand they have outside of the uh, universities, and also, uh, most importantly, you know, uh, what is their, uh, what is their, um, you know, relationship with the, uh, with their, with their current distribution company, you know, how much energy are they receiving? So I think there are quite uh, a few factors, uh, you know, that we need to consider, you know, before uh, we are able to um, give you some of those uh, uh, intricate details, even though, you know, some of my colleagues are online, you know, uh, they might have more to add, but I've noticed that they are only part of the attendees, you know, uh, I mean, in terms of SDG 7, we also work a lot in partnership. So uh, my colleagues are online. I don't know if the host can be kind enough, maybe to allow Barbara uh, to speak to, uh, to to some of the specifics. Maybe she has uh, one or two things to add uh, onto the conversation. So I can see that Barbara has been allowed to speak. Uh, to come on to the uh, attendees. So maybe Barbara, if you can just uh, speak additionally to this question as well, please. Thank you. B Barbara, you're on mute. Are you, can you hear us? Yes, I can. I, I dropped off for a bit. The internet went down for a bit. Just beginning back the internet so um Lina, could you be kind enough to repeat your question for barbara please yes of course uh, so so what i was saying is um just on the quantum of the of the investment that you're looking for and kind of the the the, the equity and debt distribution in terms of how you're thinking about uh, financing these projects. I uh, I was aware that in the beginning you mentioned that you've kind of used uh, part of the green bond, uh, the sovereign green bond uh, proceeds towards um, part of phase one, I think, or or the entire phase one of the project. So just uh, just get, trying to get an understanding of how you're planning on or how you're thinking about financing these through debt and equity or through a mix. Um, thanks, Lena, and. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. Um, standing on the existing protocol. Um, like you mentioned, the first um, phase of the EP was for naturally green bond. However, the second part of it, like the MD mentioned, and the third um, EP um, phase are being funded through um, facility from the World Bank and AFDB to the federal government. For EP4, we're looking at a mix right, um, debt equity, possible brand somewhere to make it affordable. Again, because the first three EP have been funded or are being funded by the federal government, it means that um, the government is taking up a lot of the costs versus the structure for EP4, where we'll probably be engaging on a completely different structure, expecting it to pay back um, through revenues generated. So probably a mixed um, low interest funding if available, um, subordinate debt where possible, um, and other instruments that will make this project achievable. Again, when we're doing energy transition projects such as these ones, um, they do not fit your typical um viable um investment structure because we're trying to power institutions some case universities and in other cases hospitals i don't know if this gives you an idea of what we're thinking of yes thank you that's that that was that was really great thank you barbara 
Um, so thank you, Lena. That was uh, very insightful to kind of understand how we're thinking about um, debt versus equity going forward. Um, I believe, uh, Felix, you did have, uh, you did raise your hand earlier and had maybe a question or a comment. So the floor is yours. Hey, hi. Thanks a lot. Nice to be here. This SDG investment fair is now becoming a highlight where we really speak business and um, it's, it's very important for a, a bureaucrat like myself in the European Commission to be able to, to listen to some real stuff that I can adapt my thinking to. As you know, we have launched a EU Nigeria digital economy package with the Vice President of the Commission visiting Nigeria a couple of months ago, uh, not only in digital, but on green and youth. And in the Africa Summit, we launched the Global Gateway and its Africa investment package with 150 billion uh, euros of investments in the next years. Um, and of course, we're very excited about the possibility of working together with Nigeria. You've mentioned there, um, Hamad, the uh, a reference to Nigerian green bonds. Um, how do the green bonds uh, from Nigeria relate or co-finance or co-invest in the project that you're doing? And the question comes out also because we, in the next I think year, we are planning to set up an investment vehicle that allows to um, promote, to incentivize and to de-risk green bonds. Um, and we're very interested in, of course, when you work on green bonds, one part of it is how do you, um, what the emission side of things, how do you issue a green bond? But of course, the important part from our side and trying to get investors to come and, and sign up to those green bonds is the actual pipeline uh, of projects that will be financed by those green bonds and by the investments that will be brought in. And I wanted to, to know how do you link up or what's this, the part of the green bonds in the, um, in the investment that you've, uh, you've presented today. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Felix. Uh, and I think uh, with the investment from the green bonds, uh, this is strictly speaking currently to the phase one of the project, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, and what the green bonds did uh, during that time is that uh, it actually was a sovereign green bond where Nigeria on its own uh, raised the bond of almost about uh, 12 billion uh, Naira, you know, uh, and that money uh, actually was raised as debt that went straight into the uh, 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 Nigerian budget. So it was actually a funding mechanism for the then Nigerian budget where, you know, uh, uh, anchored by the Federal Ministry of Environment, you know, uh, they came up with a framework uh, where they identified uh, the use of those proceeds, you know, so that uh, they were able to now justify uh, to the likes of the Climate Bonds Initiative and Moody's, uh, they came up with a rating uh, for the particular use of those proceeds. And those projects were not only the beneficiary of the, uh, of the Green Board, it actually spanned across other adaptive and, and mitigative uh, projects uh, such as uh, afforestation uh, with the Great Green Wall uh, and the Department of Forestry within the Federal Ministry of uh, Environment. Uh, we also looked at uh, some projects within the uh, Federal Capital Territory for the uh, you know, light rail and, uh, and things like that. So this is the first phase of what uh, the federal government did you know, uh, in terms of understanding how they could uh, raise those green bonds. And they primarily raised those green bonds uh, through uh, pension administrators. Uh, where we had, you know, uh, transaction advisors such as the uh, uh, Stambik uh, IBTC, who then engaged uh, with those private, uh, uh, sorry, with the with the pension administrators, who then raised those uh, bonds on behalf of uh, the Nigerian government. So, in terms of the pipeline of projects, you know, there is currently uh, an, an interministerial committee 
uh, within the climate change uh, uh, department of the Federal Ministry of uh, Environment, where they actually uh, 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 relate to various uh, ministries, uh, so such as the Federal Ministry of Agriculture, uh, ministries like the Ministry of Power, you know, Works and Housing, and they identify those projects through the budget office, where from the start of uh, initiating those projects, uh, the budget office uh, you know, identifies them as green projects uh, and would be able to benefit uh, from, uh, uh, from a potential green bond. So I'm aware that uh, currently they have put, uh, they have uh, you know, done the first phase, of course. There's also a second phase uh, of the green bonds that are currently being done. You know, uh, and I, I believe there's, there's going to be a third phase of the sovereign green bonds as well. But I think to your point, Felix, uh, you know, you are also speaking now directly to maybe having private sector raise some of these bonds. But so far, what we have done in Nigeria uh, is strictly uh, a sovereign green bond, and that's what uh, the country has been working uh, uh, on. You know, in, in, with the Federal Ministry of uh, Environment, uh, the uh, Debt Management Office, uh, the Federal Ministry of Finance. And, and various uh, uh, ministries and MDAs that have this sort of uh, green projects. So as part of what we also signed up for uh, within the um, green bonds, we are currently reporting back uh, to the green bond secretariat the emissions that uh, currently were saving uh, in terms of uh, CO2, you know, and uh, as part of what we agreed uh, to certify those bonds with the Climate Bond Initiative, uh, we have been reporting uh, that back to to the federal ministry of uh, to the federal ministry of uh, environment. Thank you, Ahmad. Um, I just uh, see that um, you know we have Safia Usman online right now, um, and will attempt to speak on behalf of uh, Adashina about the other projects. So um, let's let's try to see if we can get that uh, running. Thanks. Safia, the floor is yours if um, you're able to um, connect. It says your mic is still on mute. Hello. Oh, we can hear you. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Hello, good evening, everybody. Hello, good we can evening, hear you. everybody. Please start. Okay, I'm so sorry for the hitches. Um, Mr. Emmanuel has been having some technical problems, so uh, we thought it could be resolved, but unfortunately, it wasn't able to. Um, so I'm looking at the slide from um, Chikasen. Um, Chikasen Group um, actually is one of the indigenous companies that we've been promoting. They have like um, five or six projects with NIPC that we've been trying to promote for investment purposes. The company has six arms, manufacturing, trading, mining, real estate, and construction. This particular project is um, for recycling plants of about 40,000 tons per annum recycling plants plastic recycling plants to be precise. So it's a manufacturing sector. And um, actually the, uh, the project size is uh, about $40 million. And then the amount they are seeking for investment is 16 million because most of the capital has already been put into the business. So the, the model they are looking at is PPP, equity or debt, and um, 10 to 15 year period of project and they are looking at um, five to 10 years for return on investment for any would-be investor. And um, of course, they have uh, the commercial feasibility studies for any investor who is interested in the project. So the second project, sorry, if I can go to, yes, the on, on, uh, on the part, yes. This project also is from the Ondo State um, 
Development and Investment Agency is one of the agencies that we, um, uh, we collaborate with. And the project is for the, an island deep sea port in Western Nigeria that is supposed to be a gateway between the north and south and east and west. So the, and of course, it's going to, if, if it comes on stream, it's going to decongest the Lagos port, which we all know that is heavily congested. So, and it's two kilometers offshore with the draft of 16 meter capacity of supporting modern ship vessel. The investment opportunity is a joint venture in build, own, operate model. And the investment is the design, construction, and operation of the deep sea port. It's going to be situated in Ondo State and um, is um, an infrastructure, uh, as you can see, is an infrastructure project. And of course, the, the, the money sought or the, the capital sought is $2 billion because, of course, it's a very huge investment. The business model they are looking at is a joint venture equity of a 50 year, like I said, build, operate, own, with 10 year return on investment. And of course, they, they have the business plan and feasibility study for any would be investor to cite if they are interested. And I'm, of course, we also invited the project owners to this, um, to this uh, meeting, to this event, so that if there is any investor that wants questions, that has questions, that wants um, clarification, they can speak to the investor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Safiya. Um, I guess uh, given that I'm mindful of time, so maybe we can um, get um, some quick uh, comments, thoughts, feedback on these additional projects um, from the panelists. Um, who would like to go first? This time? Madam Chair, since I haven't spoken, maybe I'll take the mic. Um, and really, really very pleased to be here. Uh, for those of um, uh, on the call that don't know who RMB is, we are the investment uh, bank arm of uh, First Rent, and we are the largest financial institution uh, in Africa. Obviously, Nigeria is like a second home to us. It's a, it's a place that we know fairly well, uh, and it's really good to see Her Excellency. Uh, and a, a great pity maybe that my very good friend, Mr. Emmanuel, couldn't speak. Um, so I had a couple of comments and questions as well. Um, uh, and in Che, if you allow me, maybe I'll start from the first project and with two questions, really. The first one would be, you know, um, what did you learn from phase one uh, that perhaps, you know, you, you would like to, to change going into phase two? And then on the second one is a semi-question, semi-comment as well. Uh, I mean, we generally talk about green bonds and I'm almost thinking here, I haven't heard us, you know, really speaking holistically about sustainable finance and really looking at, you know, the fact that we, we having electricity for universities. Have we really thought maybe, you know, something along the, the lines of social bonds or anything of the likes uh, in the sustainable finance area? And then the last one is really on the last project. Um, I see that, you know, a uh, very good project. Uh, I think anybody who's uh, looked at the Lagos sport would know how congested it is. And I see that, you know, you're looking at the 2 billion project, which is fairly large. And I just wanted to find out if any, you know, uh, feasibility studies and bankable studies have been done to date. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Teres. And uh, maybe before we um, go back to the presenters, we can get like some um, comments from Lena and um, Felix as well. I'm happy. I'm happy to uh, to pitch in. I think. I mean, uh, again, great project. And I and I um, uh, I would second the point that Titus made on the on the social aspect of things. Um, it's really important to highlight the importance of a just transition in 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 Nigeria, um, and the requirement to put these things in place to and and high, and make sure that they are that they are highlighted. One of the things that I would uh, I would say is. It's really important to kind of put a quantifiable measure against the 
impact of these projects. So, for example, the re recycling project uh, is, is a really interesting one. Um, it would be really good to kind of put some sort of impactful, um, uh, quantifiable measures against um, against against those projects, because then it it brings it brings to light um, the importance of these projects and what they are what they are achieving. I think having scale in place is really important and kind of building that scale in order to uh, to progress uh, would be great. And I think um, more importantly as well, um, identifying what is required to kind of make sure that these projects are, are bankable, are financeable uh, through implementation of sustainable finance uh, uh, structures would also help with the, with, the, with the equity piece in addition to the debt piece. So that's my two cents. Uh, thank you so much for the, for the presentation. If I can add uh, a little word of support to that, uh, that Lena just mentioned, I think somebody in the chat also raised the issue of the coverage of the electrification in terms of equitable pro uh, coverage. Um, and I think it's important for all of us to have a little, you know, a better understanding of what the impact is. I'm also looking at the, the deep sea port and I wonder uh, if I think that I have some information that the port of Amper is, is, um, is also looking at Nigeria as one of its possible investment opportunities. So I wonder if, if uh, we could be helpful in that regard. Thank you. Um, a big thank you to the panelists for your insightful comments as well as the questions that you've asked. I'll actually now hand it over to the presenters. Maybe you can kind of speak to, um, I believe uh, we mainly were talking, curious about, you know, the social impact metrics as well as the feasibility studies with relation to the port and how um, the, the various um, stakeholders can come in and kind of support this um, and so on. So. Um, yeah, back to the presenters to kind of um, speak to these aspects. Hello, Ahmad and Safiya. Yes. yes, we can hear you, Safiya. Can you hear me? Yes. The audio is messing up. Um, yes, okay. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Okay, yes. Um, to answer to what Lena said, um, I understand that the, it, we have to deal with the impact in terms of um, SDG uh, goals. And um, for the plastic recycling, um, what I know from the project is that uh, it's going to really empower the women, children, because I mean, if you know how uh, recycling works, the collection and uh, sorting, so they are going to engage a lot of women, children, and um, to, to do most of the collection, which of course is going to empower them um, financially because they will be given uh, some token for bringing um, these um, plastics for recycling. So they're going to have a collection point at some point um, in the state and um, all around where they, where they gather all this um, uh, the materials for recycling and of course um, of course we know environmentally it's going to help help the environment in keep, keeping it clean and um, removing all the plastics that are injurious to the animals and of course the environment so it's also going to be um, a very uh, yeah, uh, beneficial to the environment and in terms of the deep sea I didn't really get what uh, Mr. Felix said but um, I, I also want to uh, reiterate the fact that um, um, you all know that in terms of import export the, the, the ports are very important as linkage uh, for, for investment and of course industrialization which in turn is going to uh, boost the economy and empower women children and um, of course the economy is going to boom and um, for some of the risk they looked at in this is in, in, in the project is um, the fact that economic downturn would affect, uh, would, I mean, ordinarily affect the, the project in terms of global economic downturn. But um, how they intend to mitigate this, of course, is because the Nigerian market is very large. And when you put in consideration, of course, the West African region, the uh, AFCFTA, the African continental free trade, is going to boost uh, this project because um, 
even if there's an economic global economic downturn, we are going to resort to the Nigerian market and also the regional market. And um, of course, for the plastic recycling too, uh, one of the risks they looked at was um, power, but um, they are looking at also putting in place, um, um, of course, um, they are looking at solar and other sources of environmentally friendly power to, to, to power the projects. The project. Uh, so I don't know if I've answered the question. Like I said, I didn't get quite yet what uh, Felix said towards the end because the audio was poor. Thank you. Um, Felix, I don't know if you wanted to maybe quickly um, recap any other additional aspects that uh, Sophia could speak to. Or if not, I can actually check in with Ahmed if he had any comments um, to in, in any of the panelists or to one of the questions from the audience about, um, as um, Felix mentioned, uh, the scope of the power project investment and um, in terms of equitable coverage in the country. But if you're speaking, um, you're still on mute. Um, I believe at this point we are about ready to wrap up as um, it looks like we're still having technical difficulties. Um, thank you so much, um, uh, Team Nigeria, for this very insightful presentation. I'm sure we learned a lot in terms of the potential scope of opportunities at this point, as well as um, some of the experiences you've already had and the lessons learned. Thank you, um, especially also to the panelists for taking time um, and and providing your valuable feedback and comments and thoughts um, um, on 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 the presentation. Uh, thank you, everybody, and I will now hand over to um, Barry um, for you know uh, a briefing on um, tomorrow's sessions. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, apologies for the technical problems. Um, I'm hoping at a future fair we can have Nigeria come back and uh, on a, a on a stabler platform and tell more because the story that's happening in Nigeria is fantastic. Um, just wanted to let first of all thank uh, Nirada for moderating during such difficult circumstances, and to our panelists, the same. Much appreciated for coming in. Please stay tuned tomorrow or tune in tomorrow. Um, if you've registered, you have the agenda and uh, we have an excellent uh, presentations by Guatemala and El Salvador. There's going to be a panel on public development banks and their roles in SDG investment. We have a side of there with the side event with the joint SDG fund and they actually have funds available. So if you're looking for investment, that's something you want to uh, tune into and then there will be a GISD side event on mobilizing the MDBs or getting the MDBs to mobilize private finance. So tomorrow is a full day, lots of different exciting things. Please join us and we appreciate your uh, participating today. Thank you very much and we look forward to you uh, joining us the rest of the week. Thanks, take care. <laughs>